and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I would like to talk about Louis de Broglie. And Louis de Broglie made a very interesting postulate in terms of the nature of matter, in particular electrons. But before we start we need to quickly review Niels Bohr. And if you remember Niels Bohr developed a model, a planetary model of the atom where the electrons are in specific discrete orbits and those orbits are quantized and he dated that because they have angular momentum. But the questions are asked. Firstly, okay they have angular momentum but why do they have angular momentum? The second question to ask is okay that's fine but why do they have also discrete energy levels? So the solution came about by a brilliant scientist in France named Louis de Broglie. Now before I go on, you might read this as Louis de Broglie. Uh, that's not how you pronounce it, it's Louis de Broglie. So what did Louis de Broglie do? Well, he asked two important questions. The first question he asked was, well, if light has both wave-like properties and particle-like properties, can matter, which has particle-like properties, have wave-like properties? Now, you might remember in 1905, Einstein's theory on the photoelectric effect showed that light can behave like waves, of course, but in the photoelectric effect, it showed it behaved like particles. And so Louis de Broglie asked the question in reverse. If light can act like particles, can matter act like waves? The second question he asks is, oh, well, can we explain Bohr's postulate that an electron can be in discrete stable orbits without emitting energy? So let's explore how he actually achieved this. But before we go on, let's briefly do some mathematical analysis. Do you remember, of course, that momentum is equal to mass multiplied by the velocity? Similarly speaking, energy or the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. But both of these formulas do not take into account the theory of special relativity. Both of these formulas fail when we start getting to speeds close to the speed of light. And so both of them can't be used. But if we allow for mass dilation, we now get some new formulas. We get p is equal to m over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared multiplied by v. And so now we have a formula for momentum. And similarly speaking, the kinetic energy will equal to the mass multiplied by c squared, of course, but over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now I am talking about kinetic energy here. If I take this formula over here, and rearrange it slightly, I can now say that the momentum divided by the velocity is equal to the mass over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, as you can see, I have that actual value right here. And so I now can have a new formula that says E is equal to the momentum c squared over v. And now if I rearrange that formula, I can now get V over C is equal to the momentum multiplied by C over E. Now, why would I want to know that? Well, remind ourselves E, of course, is equal to MC squared over the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. If I square both sides, I get E squared is equal to m squared c to the fourth over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now I have v over c and so now I have a relationship I can substitute that in and I'm going to get m squared c to the fourth over 1 minus pc over e. I've substituted that in all squared. If I rearrange that, I get the total energy squared is equal to the momentum squared multiplied by the speed of light squared plus m naught, which is the rest mass squared, c to the power of 4. So this m here 
is referring to the rest mass of the object. So this formula here is a much better relationship between energy and momentum because it allows for relativity. So there's my formula. If I look at this from a photon's perspective, so now we're dealing with a photon, you know that its rest mass is going to be equal to zero. So now all of a sudden I have a formula to describe the photon's energy. I get E squared is equal to P squared C squared. And then of course, if I square root everything, I get E is equal to P C. In other words, the momentum of my photon is equal to the energy divided by the speed of light. And that is in essence what de Broglie did using this uh, determine this formula. But then we should remember that E equals HF. So now we have P is equal to HF over C. We know that C is equal to F lambda. And now I get a formula that says P is equal to H over lambda. Or if I rearrange that, lambda is equal to H over P. We have here a relationship of the photon's momentum can be determined by its wavelength. But what de Broglie said is that any object that has momentum therefore also has a wavelength associated with it. And that is the brilliance of de Broglie. He postulated that matter have a wavelength or what's often referred to as the de Broglie wavelength. So how did he take this further? Well, de Broglie postulated, of course, a mathematical solution for to de Bohr's problem. He said, well, if an electron has a wavelength, then what in, in essence it's going to be doing is it's going to form a standing wave around the nucleus. So here I have three pieces of paper, so to speak, that shows you a standing wave. In the first case, I have one wavelength. Here I have two wavelengths and here I have three wavelengths. You can see these are specific lengths. You can't get a full wavelength that is anywhere in between these sizes. Then the actual values are discrete. But what happens if I take these pieces of paper, so to speak, and curl them around to form a circle? Well, what I'm going to get is this. And I'm going to have very discrete sizes of the circles. And each of these have a very discrete radius. Here's radius one, here is radius two, and here is radius three. What I'm getting here are three loops of paper with a set amount of standing waves, but that have very discrete radii associated with them. And a standing wave is the way that de Broglie explained why the electron around an atom in terms of Bohr's model is not releasing any energy. Here are four different ways of representing de Broglie standing waves where n equals two, three, four, and five. Basically, de Broglie said the amount of standing waves is set. So the number of wavelengths that I have will always equal to two pi r. And n, of course, can only be the integer values as we continue on. Now, since wavelength is known as well, we now have a mathematical formula where we replace the wavelength with the formula that we had before. So the number of discrete wavelengths I have multiplied by Planck's constant divided by the momentum of, in this case, the electron, is equal to two pi r. So that in ways is a mathematical solution to Bohr's situation, why we have discrete energy levels. It took, however, some time before we were able to determine an experimental evidence for it. In other words, is there an experiment we can do with electrons that shows that not only does it have matter-like properties and behave like particles, but actually exhibit wave-like properties. 
and that did occur with the experiments of Davison and Germer in the mid-20s. That will be a subject of my next video. I hope that's helped you understand De Broglie a little bit better. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. I hope you like and share and subscribe. Till next time, bye for now.